Yes, this book is uh, excellent, I think. Um, I just want to uh, see that we can integrate his work somehow uh, into the uh, slab allocator subsystem that we can offer services to all subsystems of the kernel and not just do that for the network stack. I think it needs to be generalized. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about. There's also some other stuff that's unrelated, so I've called this a different uh, way than on the program. I want to talk generally about slab allocator developments and uh, issues that we're having right now. And one of them is the stuff that Jesper had. Um, uh, I'm the maintainer of the slab allocators in the kernel, um, but I also work for uh, uh, a trading company, and so we make money by being faster than the other companies are. And so this, but the work that Jasper's doing is dear to our hearts, and we will do everything we can to support him, <laughs> even if it's faster than my, my allocator. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> as long as the network stack gets faster, I'm fine. <laughs> Um, so, in order to support that, I've proposed a batch interface for the slab allocators. So I want to discuss that a bit and uh, talk a bit how we can integrate that into the uh, network layer. And uh, the batch interface then requires also implementation in the major allocators, SLUB and SLAB, and I have some ideas on how this could be done, and I actually have a partial implementation for one of them. Um, then moving beyond that, uh, recently there have been some fast path improvements uh, in the slab allocator. And I want to talk about that one as well, and then maybe talk a bit about slab defragmentation uh, if you have time. Again? Yeah, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get through. <laughs> Uh, well, since 2007 or so? Yeah, right, so let's see. We still have the same problem. <laughs> You've sorted it at, at some layer, and, and I have my stuff that I'm doing it at some layer. <laughs> at some point, this needs all to work, right? <laughs> you can't, I can't hear you. I can heckle now. Okay, good. Sorry, can I stop you for a second? I just want to fix your mic. Okay. Sorry. You can go for it. So is that better? Yes? <laughs> All right. All yours. Okay. <laughs> So, um, this is uh, short of it. Uh, this is a batch API that I've proposed uh, to, ex to, order to extend the slab allocators. So, instead of a Cayman cache free, you have a Cayman cache free array. It's actually the simplest operation. You just uh, pass it the number, the name of the cache, and uh, the number of elements you want to, want to free in an, in an array. And then it goes about and just frees all these things. Pretty simple. Um, the allocation is, uh, is also pretty straightforward, I think. Um, you have the, the cache where you want to allocate the stuff, uh, the allocation flags, how many you want, the pointer to the array of uh, objects where the addresses should be stored. And then uh, we just added a flag to today because uh, last yesterday we talked about some of the uh, semantics that we wanted from this uh, operation and we added some additional semantics that we're going to discuss in the next slide. Um, so the patch that I proposed uh, contains a fallback implementation for all these things, so if we merge the stuff, we would have the functionality, but the allocators are not optimized yet. Then we get into the fine details of how do we actually make use of these things and how do we uh, squeeze the maximum performance for batch allocations out of the allocators. Um, so the bug alloc modes that we wanted to add here. So we added here a flex argument at the very end, the Kingdom Cache Alloc Array. And uh, in order to understand this, you have to see how these, these allocators work. They usually uh, reserve objects that are for each processor. So if a processor needs an, an, a new slab object, it can take it from the local queue and doesn't need to do any locking. And so usually all allocators have a number of these, of these objects cached for services that are needed. And uh, so um, if, if, it, if that... Uh, the CPU uh, queue is empty, then the allocator needs to go to a memory pool that is node-specific. Remember, yeah, we are in a NUMA system. 
and, uh, and the, uh, all allocators have a list of slab pages where some objects are still free. So it can search through the slab pages that still have free objects and can pick up some of these and allocate from those. If that fails, the allocator usually goes to the page allocator, allocates a new page frame, and hacks that page frame to pieces and dishes out new objects. So each of these has various performance implications, and that's why we want to control these in the batch alloc uh, function call. So um, if you say slab array alloc local, then the idea is, okay, we want to just extract all the CPU local objects because we want maximum performance. We want to take, don't want to take any locks. So the, the, uh, the bulk alloc will give you everything that's available there, and if, if, if there's not enough available, it will not give you any more objects. So that could be probably used for the fast path where you need to make some objects in the fastest way possible. Um, then slab array alloc partial. Um, this is basically you go, you're going to the list of slab pages that have still objects free on a node and you take it from there. This means you leave the cache for objects alone. There may be other uh, allocations going on from other subsystems on the CPU that you don't want to impact. If you do the first one, it would drain all the, the per CPU objects and the next alloc will have to go through a page allocator or some other mechanism to get new uh, slab pages and new objects because they are gone. If you don't want to impact that, you can do slab alloc partial and just drain the partial pages uh, for each uh, node. And uh, so this is good because it preserves local objects and also it's defrag friendly because all the holes that you have in slab pages are being filled up. So nice uh, synthetic effect here, a side effect. Um, then um, the the last one is the slab alloc, er, er, alloc new. You want to bypass this whole thing. You want to take new page frames from, from the page allocator and just uh, serve it that way. The advantage there with the slab alloc uh, new is that the allocator does not need to construct a free list like it does right now. Right now, if slab or slab con uh, contacts the page allocator, gets a page frame, it needs to create a metadata structure to track the, the uh, allocated free objects. That's a lot of overhead. If you do this and go directly to the page allocator, you can skip the step and immediately construct an array of pointers to the objects in the, in the, in the page frame and serve that to the application. And the metadata doesn't need to be initialized of the slab page. At least it can be, the initialization effort can be reduced. And though this is actually the fastest allocation mode if you want to do a bulk alloc. Let's say you need, you need 5,000 objects. This is certainly the fastest way to do that. What would you do with, uh, for example, you've got a page, you haven't used it completely, what would you do with the tail part of the page? Would you then go and put that, those objects onto a free list somewhere? Uh, well, the, what we're thinking right now is that the slab area alloc local would just stop with, with the local objects if they're not on money more, and the slab area alloc new would just take uh, full pages. If, you, if there's a partial page that would be allocated, it wouldn't do that, it would just switch on the objects that fit in a complete page. Okay, so if you had like 17 objects per page and you asked for 64, mm -hmm. you wouldn't get 64 back, you'd get 17 times 4, or yeah. 17 yeah. times 3. Yeah. Okay. Well, we haven't cleared the exact semantics, we just, again, last night <laughs> at 2 a.m. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just thinking of how, because you know, I can see use for that in, in various file system paths, but we'd need a guarantee of the exact number of objects that get returned back. Okay. Maybe we need an add an, an option to just give me the exact uh, number of objects, and then it could it could fall back from one more to the other yeah. if, if there's only a few left and take the partials instead of going for the full. Yeah, yeah. And do you see any use case for the first one? I have had a difficult time thinking about that. Uh, would, there, would there actually be a fast path case, path case for that? That you need a series of objects in a fast path. I suspect that the first one, you know, from my perspective, I can see that you'd want at least one hot object, mm -hmm. which is going to be the first one that you reference and actually use, but the rest of them, not necessarily. Okay. Um, what, what, about a, what, a, what, what about a use case where, where you want to, you have a, a tree and you want to expand? So is, you, you really would like to allocate two objects uh -huh. because you want to expand the node to have two? So, so, so we, we, you, you would get, you could ask for two, two elements, uh -huh. only two elements, because it would make me expand my tree. 
Uh-huh. Well, if you, uh, this is a bug alert mode. I think if you ask for two objects, it might be better to use two Kimalux. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it will be amortized at that yeah, level. I'm, I'm not sure. To, I think we're going to look at 10 or more before this makes any sense. Yeah, my use case is a, a bit larger. Right? Okay. But, but like 64. Yeah, 64, yeah. That's my big use. The numbers I'm thinking of are 32, 64. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't need a guarantee. I would be, mm-hmm. in my system, I'd be happy just to get something fast and Mm-hmm. not ex- get the, the exact number I'm asking for. Okay. So then um, the first idea is on how to do the bug alloc mode in, in an SLUB. So I posted, this is a draft of this uh, when the bug alloc API was discussed. Um, the problem with slab is it has this uh, free list where one object, free object links to the next free object. And this means if you traverse the free list, you're touching the first cache line of each object. And so, so that's a bit of an, of an issue. Uh, so in, in, in every case that you're dealing with, with the partial lists and uh, the uh, space view free lists, you have to traverse the array and you have to touch every cache line. Um, if you take the page directly from the page allocator, then you don't need to initialize this stuff and you don't need to touch all the objects. So this would be uh, inherently the fastest motor that would be available. So uh, one of the performance optimization that you can do if you do this part list stuff is, right now you take a single page off the free list when you uh, came in cache alloc, and then it drops the lock again. Now you can take the log and you can take as many pages as you want of the partial list and process it. So the log taking and log release for the per node log is no longer uh, there. But uh, the traversal of the linked lists is there. Still taking cache misses. Yes, you're still taking cache misses there. Unless you go directly to the page allocator and take, get a new page frame and avoid all this mess. So... Um, I have some draft code that I haven't, haven't even run yet, but uh, I think this is possible to do. And I also need to do the memory applications that we discussed last night. Um, and if you look at the structures here, this is kind of an attempt to draw all the metadata structures for slab in one slide. It could be a bit complicated. Um, so if you look at the object format, you see that uh, in one case you have the, when, when it's green, it's in use, and you have the payload there, and if the object is freed, you have the free pointer pointing to the next object. Uh, so this is a single object format, and if you look at the page frame content here, you see um, how the free lists work. From the page frame descriptor, uh, the free list pointer points to the first free object, which points to the next one, which points to the next one. At some point you get a null pointer, and then the free list is, is uh, at the end. If you want to extract the objects, you have to walk the free list here, walk all the free, the free pointers, and record all the pointers of the objects. And so the, the free list is one where you have the free list of... Uh, from the page frame. If you want to access that free list, you need to take a log. There's the other free list that is from the, from the passive use structure, but you don't have to take a log for the fast path. It's, it's the same thing nested here, and there can actually be multiple free lists, it can be two free lists in a slab page of, of, of objects. Because there could be local allocation and local freeze and concurrent remote freeze and re, uh, remote allocs, and the, the allocator can handle that at the same time in order to, to give you optimum performance. And so if we want to do a local object alloc, we would traverse this, this portion here, here to extract all the uh, pass view objects. If we do all the language the partial lists, we walk the partial list up there and then go to the page descriptors, take the logs, and extract the objects that way. So these are the first two operation modes that we had before in the flags. Any questions on that? So um, in Slab, this is easier because Slab has a table of free objects at the beginning of the, of the Slab page. It doesn't have the, uh, the nested list from object to object. And so the, the, the free list can be traversed in a cache-friendly way now. Um, and there are already errors of pointers that should be paired in the alien queues. So you could just do a mem copy to copy the pointer arrays over into the big array and just uh, zap them. 
So that may be actually more friendly uh, to the approach here. And I hope I have the same thing for slap here. So, uh, I think I've omitted something because this is, otherwise it gets too complicated. The free list is, um, the details on the free list are not here. So the object format is different here in slab. You have the payload, and if the object is free, then the object is not being touched. Because at the beginning of the page frame, you have a free list. We have a table of all the free objects. Um, that uh, usually fits mostly into a, into a one cache line. And you optimize that so that we have one byte per object that's in the page frame. So it's very compact and uh, can be traversed easily and we should be able to, in a rapid way, construct a table of uh, pointers to objects for the bulk alloc. But uh, the basic principle is the same. If you go for the local allocation, you traverse the array cache that's uh, processor specific and first of all extract these entries and um, otherwise you have the, uh, the alien caches and the per node caches where you can also extract these objects. Questions on this? Or is this just too much detail? <laughs> um, then, uh, any more questions on the whole business of the bug alloc? Are you satisfied? Okay. Yeah? <laughs> it's nothing new. I know the structure of this stuff already. So. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really like it too because I, I wasn't into the memory area. Okay. I actually had studied these two slides in okay. detail to figure out how it works. Okay. <laughs> it helps me a lot. So we have no disagreement on how to proceed on this one. Yeah. I, I would, I would, of course, you, you would like the API to go in. Yeah. And, and I would like to, to test different implementations to figure out if it's mm -hmm. fast enough or not. Yeah, I think we first need to get the API in, so I need to have your uh, sign on that. Hang on, Paul. Um, the last free isn't referenced by the array cache for some reason, or it just needs a pointer there? there, this, there. Yeah, the, the array should be going up. Okay, this is it slips to the flags. It should, should be up one down. The array should be pointing to the uh, array cache there. And the array cache is basically a, 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 a list of pointers. Yeah, I've got that. The, the green free on the far right but yeah. between object and padding, should mm -hmm. that have a pointer to it or is that some el something else going on there? Should that have a pointer from the en an entry of something to it or is that just... No, no. Uh, so uh, the array cache can have pointers to multiple uh, slab pages. Uh, so, th so there might be another array cache yeah. that references that one. Yes, yeah, okay, so it's it. just to show that it must not cover all the objects in a page. Because the slab allocator has localization. It only, the uh, person use structures only cover the, the objects of one slab page. And therefore it ensures that all other objects allocated are, are local and the TLB misses don't occur that frequently. For slab disperses the stuff and it doesn't preserve locality in that sense. Any other questions on this or comments? Then I guess we, we can, uh, after the, the next week, I'll probably then come up with a patch to at least get the generic infrastructure in there. Yeah. And then uh, we hopefully can get that merged by Andrew. And then we can start working on the uh, alloc implementations for the two allocators. Okay. Um, then there were some recent uh, fast pass improvements in, in SLUB. Um, basically, the problem that we had uh, is that uh, conflict preempt uh, requires uh, a print enable and disable in the fast path. Initially, uh, the real time folks switched to the SLUB allocator and saw 40% improvement on, on kernel performance because uh, all the IQ disable, local IQ save and restore these heavy operations are not used by SLUB. And uh, they had actually peer-to-view locking going on in the old RT version before they switched to SLAUB. 
And so they saw a huge uh, increase in performance. And that was saddened by the news that we needed to have a preempt disable and enable around two instructions that fetch GPU local data. And so uh, we are tr we're trying to find ways to avoid that to restore the config preempt uh, performance. And so I did a rather complex scheme involving uh, being able to reconstruct the page struct from the free list pointer, uh, which was an invasive operation on the, on the SLUB cache. And John Kim found a way to just do a retry there in a loop in the fast path that avoids all the stuff. And so we, uh, that has been merged and uh, it will be essentially merged by Andrew into his next tree and it's going to be in 320. And so then the, the, the issue with the config print is gone and the uh, real-time performance has been restored to the way it was before. Um, yeah, maybe one thing I could do. Ah, no, I wanted to see the last slide here. So, in order to understand it a bit better, uh, let's talk a bit about the slab fastpath fast architecture. So, the one of the uh, the reason that I wanted to do uh, SLUB was to rework the complex nature of the fast pass in SLUB because I couldn't get it uh, much lower latency than it was already because uh, there was always an interrupt disabled and necessary and the touching of, of uh, various numerous cache lines. So I avoided trying to avoid that. So this, the SLUB fast pass, what it does instead of uh, interrupt disable, it does speculative operations and then uh, uses uh, a person view atomic operation to affect a state change on the person view queue. And only that state change uh, uh, requires, uh, that's, that's a state change, that's, that's a, there's only one state change on the, on the CPU queue. And therefore, this single state change is not subject to uh, being interrupted by any uh, hardware interrupts and stuff. And so uh, this means that the operation of the fast path is safe even in the face of interrupts, because it's a single instruction. And this, cuts, this kind of approach cuts the number of cycles spent in the fast pass. And so when we compare to SLAB, we have roughly have only half of the cycles in the fast pass in SLUB. And in order to fetch these operations for the speculative operation, we need to ensure that they come from the same view. So operations to ensure uh, that we retry the operations if we figure out that the CPU was changed. And for that purpose, we need to have the uh, preempt enable and disable in there. And you can look at the code here. I just stripped this down to the minimum necessary. Uh, so this is the current broken code uh, with the preempt uh, enable and disable removed for brevity's sake. <laughs> And so what, what this thing does is it figures out uh, C is the, the current pointer to the current uh, pairs of view queue. So it uh, finds the offset of the pairs of view structure from the CPU slab, calculates it, which is my pairs of view structure, and then it reserves and then it gets a transaction ID. The transaction ID is used to um, ensure that we are staying on the right uh, processor and that nothing is happening in between. Um, so, uh, takes its transaction ID, determines speculatively the object that we were getting, which would be the head of the, of the free list, and figures out on which page this object, from which page the object will, come, will be coming to. And then we check if this operation would be successful. If we wouldn't have an object there, then the queue is empty. This means we have to go to the slow path, and um, we can't use the fast pass at all. And the other criterion is, if the page is not the correct node, and we wanted memory actually from a different node, then we also can't do this. We need to go to the slow pass to convince the allocator to switch to a different uh, node first. Because uh, the, our cube is coming from the wrong numeral locality. If, that is, uh, if those uh, criteria are not met, then we can use the fast path. We could use the fast path. Uh, figure out what the next object will be following this object. And now we're trying to do a comp exchange, replacing the, um, the current free list uh, with the next object, and also we are incrementing the, uh, the transaction ID to the next one. And we need to meet that transaction ID. If there's a mismatch in terms of the, the free list was changed, the transaction ID was changed, then we have to redo this whole operation. And so, 
this fast path has no interrupt disable, it has no locks, and it has no atomic operations. The, this CPU comp exchange is a comp exchange without lock semantics. But, but the, 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 double, the double compare exchange is a bit, costs a bit more. In a single one, yes. It, it, yeah, the double compare and exchange costs a, a bit more than the normal compare and exchange. Yeah. But again, it's, it's lockless. It's, so it, it does not synchronize between CPUs. This is only used to synchronize with interrupts on the local CPU. That's, that's true. If there would be an interrupt occurring, and in the interrupt, an allocation would be occurring, then you would have to retry the operation. And then the comp exchange would fail. Or if the if preemption would reschedule you on a different CPU, then also the, uh, the comp exchange would fail because the transaction ID counter would be incremented. And the transaction ID is unique per, per processor. So if the transaction ID is fetched from the wrong processor, this operation is also going to uh, be retried. So anybody can spot the bug here? That we had to... What? Okay. If, uh, <laughs> I tried to, to strip this down to the minimum. I had to <laughs> handwrite some pieces. <laughs> this was never compiled. It was just I had to fit it on one page. So it would be three pages if I would have shown you the whole thing. <laughs> okay. So uh, what was found is that um, between the distribution point of determination and the, the grabbing of the TID, uh, the processor could uh, change the CPU. My frames enabled. And now you're getting the TID from the wrong CPU, and you're operating on the CPU structure of another processor, <laughs> which is pretty bad. So the pre immediate preempt dis uh, disable and enable between the, those two um, statements. And so the trick that Johnson did is just put a, uh, another retry loop in there and to fetch this again and verify that the, uh, the value hasn't been changed. And that, that's only active for the config preempt case. So there's a minimal impact on the uh, non preempt case. And uh, there's no full, no, no preempt enabled element anymore on the fast path. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, the best I could come up with so far. If you have a better one, maybe we can optimize the fast path to use your memory barriers instead. Difficult to get faster, but yeah, the, 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 the automation with the, the avoiding uh, avoiding the, the preemption enable yeah. disable it it saves us like two or three nanoseconds or something. Yeah. So so we are operating in a really really small time scale. <laughs> <here. laughs> yeah, again, this is one of the most latency critical operations in the kernel because it's used by all subsystems. Yeah. Anything that you do on that level has a huge impact. Like the forty percent improvement on the real time guys. That this was just by switching the allocators and using. This code is sort of the long, lengthy stuff as an AB. Yeah, some of the stuff I'm taking advantage of is that I'm sure I won't be called from interrupt context. Yeah, okay, I can't. I don't yeah. have that assurance. Yeah. If I would have that, it would be much easier to do. Yeah. But uh, I've been begging for that for years. <laughs> Maybe we can do this at some point. So, any more questions on that? Any comments? <laughs> okay, ask a question. I'm assuming the retry you added for the preemption case is in the else clause. Mm -hmm. Why would it be in the else clause? Well, uh, uh, you mean the else clause of the unlikely up there? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's, it's and then, in and the else clause. And, and then you disable preemption in the else clause itself to prevent it from getting. You disable preemption in the else clause itself to get, prevent getting preempted again and, and changing immediately after you did the check. I can't understand you. Um, so what happens is, so, you, so I, I, I can't see the code. You have just heard you yeah. describe it. But presumably, just before the, in the, between the else and the if unlikely, the come change double, you have a check to see if you're still on the same CPU, right? No. Oh, OK. Where do you put it? 
the check of your state is in the same CPU is via the TIT. The TIT is unique to each CPU. If you would have changed this view, then the TIT would ma yeah, match. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out the fix. I'm just trying to ask a question about the fixed version. But uh -huh. I can't see the fixed version, so I'm guessing. And I think I'll defer it until I see the fixed version. The fix is, is just uh, retrieving the, uh, uh, the, the CPU pointer again. And so he, he retrieves the, the TIT before the this is, this is, this is CPU pointer construction. And then this is, goes on, and he, and he verifies that the TIT is still the same. OK, I'm just curious what happens between, the, between that verification and actually doing something if you get preempted again or if he prevents it somehow. I'll, I'll, I'll have to look at the code. Okay. It's uh, in Next, so we're not, up, not upstream yet. So if you look at Next, you can see the code. Okay. Okay. So the other thing I have is uh, the slab defragmentation stuff. Uh, so I've given this talk uh, before at the LinuxCon in Düsseldorf, but I ran into some of over time some, into some time constraints, and I think we have lots of time here, right? <laughs> so if there's nothing else, so uh, let's talk about this. Um, so um, we've done some patch sets when we both were both at SGI on this uh, back in 2007. And uh, I've actually worked a couple of years on a patch set that was finally rejected because I didn't have enough knowledge about the Dentry and iNode uh, handling. And I couldn't implement the pieces that I wanted at that level. And so uh, also this is the SLUB allocator was constructed explicitly having in mind that at some point we needed to do fragmentation. And I ran into some conceptual issues on the SLAB. So I still have a patch around that allows, would allow me to enable uh, fragmentation approaches in the SLUB allocator, but it hasn't been merged yet. Um, and this work is very similar to what we've done with page migration. Um, page migration also was initially said, this can't be done, it's impossible, and that we have to have the same things now for the, the, the uh, defragmentation. I've, last time I, I brought this up at the kernel summit, uh, I got this, oh, this is impossible, you can never do this. Um, it, it, it definitely, it is possible, at least it is, uh, my uh, code that I had or that I have is working. It doesn't do the right thing with the I, I, I know the dentry system, okay, but it defragments pages, <laughs> definitely. And so what, where we, how we got there with the page migration was by an iterative approach because nobody believed us that we can move objects, move pages between NUMA nodes. What we did first is we evicted the page from memory onto a swap and then we swapped it back in. And everybody believed in the integrity of the swap subsystem and therefore that patch went in and therefore we could slowly move pages back and forth. And then we cut out the swap subsystem and suddenly we were able to move pages directly between one NUMA node and the other. And that's how we got there. And that's how we dealt with the disbelief. And I think we can do something similar here. When we, get, we do this slowly, as first as a type of reclaim, and then gradually move into an area where we can actually migrate an object directly from one slab page to another in order to facilitate defragmentation. So the, the fundamental problem is that you, over, over time, as you operate a system, you will have slab pages that can contain, let's say, 15 objects, but as long as only one object is in, in use on, in that slab page, you cannot free the object, you cannot free the page at all. So in extreme cases that uh, also Dave has constructed, uh, you have a situation where you have a huge number of slabs that just have one object allocated in it, and there's a lot of empty memory sitting around that you can't use. Suddenly your memory vanishes, and uh, so I know and dentries are, are, are key to that, and so this is pretty bad. And so what you usually do is you drop the caches, you, you, you erase all metadata and you try to see if you can hit all these things and free as much as possible and then you redo this by reloading the dentry and inode data from the disk. And that may enable you to recover some of the memory. So uh, this is the usual architecture of the partial list of the slab allocators. You have a list of these page descriptors for all the slab pages, and in each of slab pages we have some objects that are free, um, uh, are green, and some objects that are allocated blue. And uh, typically, uh, that as you allocate, page, allocate new objects, these holes are filled up. 
So if you allocate three objects here, you get rid of the first, uh, you get rid of the uh, uh, page struct on the, for, for the top page. Or if you would free all the blue ones, you would get, get free the whole page. Right? And so the partial list overhead is one of the major things also in terms of performance of the slab allocators. Because you need to take logs to manipulate the, the, the partial list and you need to have traverse this list to find pages where you can have objects that you can allocate. It's critical to block alloc as well. And so one optimization that I've done in the SLUB allocator is I'm sorting the partial list according to the number of free objects. So that the pages with the only a few objects uh, available come first. If you do that, then every allocation can potentially take a page off the partial list. And the pages that are at the very end of the partial list will stay there longer. So the chance is better that these objects are being freed and the whole thing is, can, can, be, can be freed back to the page allocator. So this is very trivial and it um, tries to do work within the existing framework. So this is this approach. In order to do that, you need to issue a KMM cache shrink on all the uh, slab objects. And uh, the kernel actually has a slab info tool that I think barely anybody knows about. Uh, if you run the slab info tool and you give the dash s option, it sorts all the partials in the system in this way. And if you then continue operation of the system, it will hopefully reduce the number of, of partial pages in the system significantly. Questions on that? Okay, so this is basically avoiding the whole migration thing and eviction thing completely. This is what we can do today and what, 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 is, what is there. So now here we have a defragment when the partial is, the uh, partial pages with the least objects come first, and then the, 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 the lots of pages that come last. And then I found another way to, to do this also in this SLAB allocator. Um, I can do defragmentation by offer allocation. Let's say one node has a huge partial list and the other one it constantly gets, gets allocated from. In that case, the large partial list of the other node stays there. And so what I'm doing here is if the system does not indicate that the memory should come from a particular node, once in a while we go to a different node. <laughs> just to allocate something on the other node. And if you do that frequently enough, then the uh, partial pages will vanish from the other node. And there's a, uh, look, there's a parameter there where you can control that how often that should be happening. So this is also one way to control fragmentation in kind of an indirect fashion without dealing it explicitly with it. And this works best with the, with the sorting of the partial lists. If you sort the partial list, then the ones with a few objects are on top, and any operation where it just gets one object from the other node will cause a complete page to be removed of the partial list. How will that work with MemCGs and things like that? Oh, don't ask me my opinion on that one. <laughs> 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 I have never looked at, at that, how that would work. <laughs> Not well. No? <laughs> well, this is basically me trying to, to do whatever I can within the existing framework, right, without getting too invasive. We're getting more invasive as we proceed here. <laughs> so, the next one is defragmentation by eviction. Um, this is a basically rejected slab, set, uh, slab patch set that I did in 2009. Um, basically what you do is uh, you uh, allow callbacks for each of the slab caches. So if the system finds that we have a slab page that has, uh, can take 50, 15 objects but only has one, then uh, we can ask the subsystem, could you get rid of this thing? And if the subsystem says, okay, I've done so, then we have a 4K or a page frame free. That's the fundamental idea. And in order to do that, we have two callbacks. First, a get. This means uh, uh, the system establishes a, says, uh, a reliable reference to the object. Because otherwise, while we do the processing, the object can vanish. We have the same thing with page migration. So with that, we ensure that the, object's does, the object doesn't vanish. And then we call the kick function, which means uh, the subsystem can now investigate the object and see if it can be evicted from uh, memory. And so if the, if the subsystem finds it can do that, then it's fine, and then we can take the page frame out. 
And it's sort of opportunistic. So the callback can refuse to do this, and then the slab page will not be evicted. So this allows you to start this whole process in a very uh, limited way. You can just f deal with the simplest cases in the, uh, in the callback. Right? You don't have to get complicated. Um, so you can check, okay, the, the object just has one reference left, and that was established by the get, okay, let's get rid of it. Or you can then do limited checks, and you can gradually increase the complexity of the function that does the kicking out of the, of the object. So this is kind of a soft way into this whole thing. So in order to do this, also the slab allocator then is isolating slab pages. It's comparable to what page migration does with, with, for, page, for the moving a page. First, you have to isolate the page from the LIU. Uh, it does a similar thing. It, it, by, alloc by isolating the slab page, it avoids uh, that any allocation operations can occur on the slab. And therefore, uh, since there cannot be any new allocations, we can, if, you, and if you can then remove all the existing objects, then the, the slab page can truly be, be uh, freed. Any questions on the eviction process? Do you think that's possible? <laughs> um, so one of the things here is is that a lot of the slab caches where you'd want to be doing this on dentry caches, inode caches, various things like that, mm -hmm. they already have an LRU. Um, yeah. It's keeping track of things that have no references. Mm -hmm. um, so the act of actually taking a reference on it will actually re tend to remove it from the LRU. Okay. Um, or or actually. When you drop the reference, if, you know, it can change its position in the mm -hmm. LRU. Um, so from this perspective, what we're looking at here is, is that the slab allocator has kind of a different method of uh, determining what needs to be freed, mm -hmm. which would then give us two different callbacks, memory reclaim callbacks into mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever subsystem it is um, that has to deal with these issues in different ways. Um, I'm kind of, I mean, it's been, what, five years since I last looked at this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I kind of think that we're probably better to, to look towards integrating the actual slab reclaim mm -hmm. into the slab cache itself. Well, the slab reclaim is, is basically also outside of the slab allocators. It's, it's, it's part of that, the... That's the thing. Uh, the, see, the slab reclaim is also outside of the page reclaim. It sits mm -hmm. off to the side. Mm -hmm. um, so I much prefer to see a solution that brings the, the, the slab reclaim more into line um, mm -hmm. rather than adding a second method that is completely different and mm -hmm. requires object references and completely ignores mm -hmm. LIUs and so on. I'd much prefer to see that there's a, a method, you know, the defragmentation method mm -hmm. that uses reclaim uh, kind of aligns with the existing mm -hmm. reclaim or the existing reclaim is aligned with the method of reclaim that's needed for defragmentation. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, so we only have one specific method of doing mm -hmm. well, then we need to ex expose uh, low-level slab partial uh, list details to the slab reclaim function. And then you have some kind of function that maybe sorts the partial list and gives you the uh, slab pages with the least objects first. Right, yes, something of the sort like that. Okay. At the moment what happens is that the, the, the existing shrinker reclaim mm -hmm. uh, basically asks the, the subsystem or asks the cache how many objects are freeable mm -hmm. um, and then says, okay, reclaim this many. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the subsystem decides which objects can be reclaimed. Right. Um, what we're doing here is is that it's not the subsystem that decides what object can be reclaimed, but the cache itself. Well, um, it, it, it proposes objects to be reclaimed. Right, <laughs> right. It proposes objects, but it's a it's the opposite situation, instead of the, the subsystem deciding what gets reclaimed, it's the infrastructure that mm -hmm. decides what needs reclaiming. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those two approaches need to be somewhat more closely aligned um, mm -hmm. into one set of infrastructure, as opposed to fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we need to have is some, some function that traverses the partial list, basically. 
Pardon, I didn't we catch that. We have a function for the, the slab we claim where we can traverse the partialists of the slab allocator. Possibly, whether it's something to do with moving the LRU information into the, the slab caches themselves, um, so that there may be like another list that says, you know, rather than uh, doing LRU on per object basis, um, you know, we reference pages rather that the objects live in rather than the objects themselves. And so the infrastructure can then walk the partial lists in LRU order. Well, the problem is that you are, you're now asking the slab allocators to have metadata information about the object itself, rather than it, it, having it abstraction need, of the no, object. No. What I'm saying is that it, we currently track information on a per-object basis, mm. whereas for memory reclaim purposes, what we really are trying to free are pages, not objects. Yeah, right. Fair picture. Um, so from defragmentation point of view, we want to select the pages that have the most amount of free objects right. on them, but from a normal memory reclaim point of view, we want to first try to reclaim the oldest objects, the right. least used, so we retain the working set in memory. Mm -hmm. So there's two different triggers there, yes. but the only difference between them is what order we walk through the page frames in the partial list. Mm -hmm. You know, so, for, for example, if we do defragmentation, you can then sort all the partial lists to find the, the ones that are most likely to be uh, defragmentation candidates mm -hmm. uh, versus the normal case, which keeps them in LIU order. Mm -hmm. Well, what we could also do is give you uh, the number of objects that are in the news in the slab page. If you have given me an object pointer, I tell you how many, page, how many objects are allocated in that page and how many are free. And then you can make a decision on that. We've still then got to go and work out whether they're referenceable, whether they're on the LIUs okay. and stuff like that. And so, well, I mean, you can work that out because this is substance specific. You know what the contents of the objects are, and you can work with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get around the, 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 the fact that we've got two different methods of yeah. tracking this information and then two different methods of reclaiming them. So but the problem is we can't really avoid these two methods because uh, I need to reclaim, I need to be, have these lists to figure out uh, where are the object, where are slab pages where I can still allocate, and you need this to uh, have a, a kind of the age of the object and refer to that. This one that Christoph's talking about is yeah, mine is basically page frame based, yours is object based. Uh, with Christoph's one, it would be perfectly valid for the subsystem to, to do another allocation inside this reclaim, right. copy it over, adjust all its pointers, and it hasn't freed any memory, right? It's just substituted one object for another. And that's a good thing to do in terms of his system. It's not a good thing to do in terms of the reclaim that you're talking about. So they're actually uh, achieving two different goals. Well, not exactly, because you can't replace an object if it's referenced. Well, this is the point. The subsystem can. Claim an the subsystem can. The subsystem can. can. No, the subsystem. Right, but the no, subsystem no. knows where the pointers are. That's the key thing. The, the, the subsystem, subsystem knows where the pointers are coming from. Not necessarily, no. Well, no, the subsystem has a if chance of knowing that here's, a, here's an object. Uh, uh, the slab allocator would really like to free this object. I, as the subsystem, can say, I know how to find all the pointers to this thing. I can be a good citizen and allocate another object. Adjust all the point now. Copy the contents over. Adjust all the pointers, and then say to the slab allocator, "Here, you can have this back. I don't need it anymore." Right. So that's a different, conceptually different thing from the reclaim that you're talking about, where the intent is to actually reduce the number of objects that the subsystem is managing. So we do have two different goals in mind here. There, there are, but the method of isolating the object for whether we reallocate it somewhere else or uh, then free it, is exactly the same. Depends so on the subsystem. The, the, the only difference is the subsequent operation once we've decided we can free it or we can move. Well, the goals are different. I don't want to reclaim objects. I want to uh, compactify my, my slab. I understand that. <laughs> what you're saying is that you're trying to add a, another method for doing something that is very similar to something we already have a method from. So it is similar, but it's also different because my method uh, has pointers to uh, page frames. You're dealing with objects. Yes, and you're not listening to me. We, can, okay. we don't really care when it comes to reclaim. 
I don't want to do a great thing. <laughs> well, the two slabs that we really care about in this case are dentaries and inodes. They're the ones that take up most of the memory on a system. Um, and they're the ones that I'm thinking of here. Yeah, but um, I have to think about all slabs in the system. No, you don't. You only have to think about the ones... to any you, subsystem. You, you only, in this case, you only have to think about the slabs that you can do a get and kick mm -hmm. from. Only the slab cases that implement those things are the yeah. ones that you'd care about. Yeah. Um, and basically, the only ones that we've implemented is the ones that can actually do reverse lookups to find all the pointers and replace them, mm -hmm. which we can't do with inodes and dentries because of all of the intricacies with things like uh, hashing, RCU freeing, um, we had, you know, same, we had the same problem like with, with page migration, and we simply said, in the case where we can't determine all the pointers, we just leave the object alone. If we can determine all the pointers, we do need educated guesses, then we can account for all the pointers, then we move the object. And that has started to make, make this possible, and subsequently we had more and more page types that would be movable. Mm. I don't think it's quite that easy. Um, the pages no. are actually much more uh, constrained in their use and structure um, mm -hmm. than various slab caches and mm -hmm. so on. Um, I mean, we have inodes that are referenced by multiple indexes mm -hmm. and there's multiple different types mm -hmm. of lockless lookups mm -hmm. that can reference that. And we can't do an atomic swap of all of the pointers to them. So you can't take it's a reference to page friends as well. Yeah. That was the same argument that was made against, against the fishman stuff. So the problem is you need to start somewhere, and we're not starting. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm getting to. You, you started by swapping stuff out. Yeah. You can't do that with slab caches. You if can't you, do that with uh, inodes and dentries, you said. Pardon? You can't do that with inodes and dentries? You, you evict them. Yes. You rec reclaim them. Mm -hmm. But this and, we is come, and we come back to then to the point is we already have a method of reclaiming. Yes, but the, the goal is not to do reclaim. The, the use of the reclaim is only an intermediate measure to, to make this possible to do the shifting of the objects. It's not the ultimate goal. Uh, uh, yeah. We're going around in circles okay. here because you're not listening to me. <laughs> okay. Mm. All right, so this is kind of a description of how this works. You lock the page, you take your reference, and you call the kick method in the subsystem. Um, and then ultimately what I would like to get, go to is to movable objects. Um, so this is required for defragmentation at multiple levels. If you have a fixed object address, then you cannot avoid fragmentation. So subsystems really need the ability to move any objects if possible. That would be very beneficial. Uh, we are getting into a situation where we have more and more uh, issues with fragmentation because we have different page sizes. We have uh, the 4K page size, the 2 meg page size, and the 1 gig page size. Systems get bigger and bigger, and we cannot really operate too well with 4K page sizes as we go further. So the future will be a mixture of different page sizes, and at this problem will be get more and more intense. And so I think at some point, there should be more pressure to get actually this done and make sure that we need to make sure that most always are movable. If that is the case, we can do much more advanced fragmentation and we can uh, avoid the issues that we have today. Um, so we can migrate pages, but the largest chunk of unmigratable memory at this point is the inode identity caches. And I think at some point we need to figure out how, some way to approach this. And uh, maybe we need to talk more about this, but I wish we would find out some way at least to get this started, at least in a very limited way. Just reclaim it. <laughs> okay, you do an echo and you drop caches and they're gone, okay. You want a brute force method like swapping? That's, that's the way to do it, just reclaim. Okay. Yeah, if you can get the... Uh, the, the kick, kick implemented as a just uh, uh, kick out. Then it's for me. Okay, that's that was the last one. Okay. Any more questions? Any other subject matters that you want to ask me about? Otherwise, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.